Around the world, hundreds of millions of people practice yoga. Even in the Western world, over 10% of people now practice yoga, and they'll tell you that it's good for their mental health and their physical health. But how much of that is just the mystique of this 5,000-year-old knowledge, and how much is actually true? Well, we reviewed the medical literature for you. So let's get into it. The word yoga comes from the Sanskrit root yuj, which means to yoke, or essentially to harness. And that's thought to refer to the ability to harness and concentrate our attention. Now, most of us associate yoga with a bunch of different physical poses, and those are called asanas. But in reality, yoga is much more than that. In fact, asanas are only a tiny fraction of the components of yoga. And that includes conscious breathing techniques called pranayama, meditation and relaxation techniques called samyana, and other elements like chanting and heating, and even broader areas like lifestyle and diet. And there are many different types of yoga. For example, hatha yoga and specifically iyengar yoga are the most common type, and those are mostly made up of stretches and restorative poses. On the other hand, ashtanga and vinyasa yoga are much more vigorous and athletic, and bikram yoga, which is the original form of hot yoga, attempts to actually emulate what the first yogis experienced back in India, which is temperatures of 105 degrees Fahrenheit and a humidity of 40%. So you can imagine that the health benefits of these different types of yoga would be quite different. So the first caveat is that most of the studies in the literature describe the impacts of hatha yoga, and the impacts of other types are less well studied and may not be the same. And generally speaking, yoga is hard to study. The studies tend to be small and most have significant flaws. The other problem is that all exercise is good for you. Many studies show multiple health benefits from exercise. And however you cut it, yoga is a form of exercise, so it wouldn't be surprising if yoga had some of those same health benefits. The real question is whether yoga is better than other forms of exercise, but most studies don't compare it to other exercise. The other problem is that the best kinds of studies are randomized controlled trials. That's where participants are randomly assigned to get one intervention or the other, and bias is reduced by blinding them so they don't actually know if they're getting the active treatment or the alternative. But the problem with studying yoga is that unlike a drug trial where you can give a real pill versus a placebo pill, with yoga you actually have to do the yoga, so you're going to know that you're getting the treatment. The only way to address that is to compare real yoga to what's called sham yoga, which is basically a fake yoga routine and neither study group would know if they were doing the real yoga. But those kinds of studies are rarely actually done. At the end of the day, the best way to figure out if yoga is effective is to combine the results of multiple randomized trials in what's called a systematic review. And if you look at yoga in the Cochrane database of systematic reviews, there's no shortage of conditions that it's been studied for. So let's start by looking at the impact of yoga on mental health. One of the core principles behind the benefits of yoga is that many illnesses are made worse by stress. And yoga, at its core, is supposed to reduce stress. Not only does stress have negative short-term impacts on the immune system, for example, but it also has long-term impacts associated with mental health problems, including anxiety and depression. And yoga is supposed to shift the balance from the stress response, or what's called the fight or flight response, which activates our sympathetic nervous system, towards the relaxation response, which involves our parasympathetic nervous system. And multiple studies have shown that yoga does reduce markers of sympathetic activity and stress hormones, and this is associated with a lower perception of stress. But studies also show that basic relaxation techniques seem to work just as well. So yoga is a form of relaxation, but there may not be anything special about yoga compared to other forms of relaxation. As for anxiety, a literature review did show improvement across multiple forms of anxiety, including things like snake phobia and obsessive compulsive disorder, but these were relatively low quality in small studies, all with less than 100 participants, and one concern is that there were high attrition rates, which means that people with anxiety may have a hard time maintaining a yoga regimen. There are also multiple randomized trials looking at the impact of yoga on depression. Again, study quality wasn't great, but reviews did find moderate evidence for short-term benefits of yoga when compared to usual care, and a suggestion that it might also perform better than relaxation techniques or even aerobic exercise. So at the very least, yoga might be considered a good add-on treatment for people with depression. We also have studies comparing yoga to standard therapy in schizophrenia, also suggesting a benefit on things like mental state, social functioning, and quality of life. 
So overall, adding yoga to usual care is likely beneficial across a slew of mental health disorders, but it's less clear if it's better than other forms of exercise. That being said, part of the secret of yoga might actually be all that stretching. Studies have found that stretching exercises significantly reduce levels of the stress hormone cortisol, and that correlates with improved perceptions of stress. So what about the impact of yoga on your physical health and diseases? So many diseases are driven by some form of inflammation, and the premise here is that yoga reduces inflammation, so it should improve disease. And studies do show that activities like yoga can decrease the expression of certain genes associated with inflammation, and they can suppress certain inflammatory cascades within our bodies. They might also boost certain immune functions like our responses to vaccines. But that's not just yoga. Those effects are also seen with meditation and with Tai Chi and Qigong. Now there are physical benefits to those various poses and stretches, and the most obvious is flexibility. Studies have shown that regular yoga practice improves not only flexibility, but also muscle endurance. And multiple studies have shown benefits for balance, which is not surprising given that many of the poses require balance and strengthen those muscles that allow us to keep our balance. On the same token, studies have shown that yoga lowers the risk of falling in older people, though this has also been shown with other forms of exercise like Tai Chi. As for gaining strength, it's probably a function of how intensely your muscles are working during your yoga. For example, in one study, eight weeks of Bikram yoga improved people's deadlift strength, but it didn't improve their aerobic capacity. On the other hand, Hatha yoga can improve physical fitness, though again, it may be similar to other exercises. The bottom line is use your common sense. If you're getting your heart racing with your yoga routine, it's probably good for your aerobic fitness level. And if you get to the point of muscle fatigue, it's probably building up your strength. And if you're improving your aerobic fitness and you're reducing your stress levels, that's probably good for cardiovascular health. We know that stress contributes to heart disease and stroke, and stress hormones like cortisol and adrenaline raise your blood pressure and your heart rate. In fact, the first ever randomized controlled trial of yoga was published all the way back in 1975, and it showed that yoga was more effective than relaxation techniques for reducing high blood pressure. That made a big splash, but again, that was one study, and it included only 34 people. But the reviews of yoga do show improvements in things like diabetes, blood pressure, and heart disease. For example, one review showed that yoga reduced fasting blood sugar levels in people with prediabetes. Another showed that it reduces hemoglobin A1c levels, which is a measure of sugar control in diabetics. Some reviews also show that yoga reduces blood pressure and heart rate. And this may be because yoga restores what's called the baroreceptor sensitivity. And that's the receptor that our body uses to regulate our blood pressure and our heart rate. Other reviews have shown improvements in body mass index, waist circumference, triglycerides, and both LDL and HDL cholesterol. All that's great, but remember that all of those effects are expected from the exercise component of yoga alone, and we still don't have the evidence that yoga is superior to other forms of exercise for those particular outcomes. Breathing, or pranayama, is a big part of yoga, so what about the impacts on the respiratory system? Well, the first study to look at yoga for asthma came out all the way back in 1985. By 2016, there were 15 randomized controlled trials, some looking just at yoga breathing techniques and others looking at the full spectrum of breathing, posture, and meditation. And there is evidence that yoga improves asthma quality of life, asthma symptoms, and requirements for rescue inhaler medications. We have a lot less evidence in the other major chronic respiratory condition, which is called chronic obstructive pulmonary disease, or COPD, but there have been a couple of studies showing that yoga breathing techniques can improve walk distances in COPD patients, though again, the effect was similar to other exercises like pursed lip breathing. The other condition that's been studied extensively is low back pain. If you're improving flexibility and muscle strength, it stands to reason that your back pain might get better. The most important trial of yoga for back pain was published in 2005 in the Annals of Internal Medicine. This was a randomized trial comparing 12 weeks of yoga to conventional exercise classes or just a self-care book. Now, at the end of the study, back function was better in the yoga group than the other groups, and that effect lasted all the way out to three months later. Now, systematic reviews published last year suggest that yoga reduces back pain intensity, disability, it improves physical functioning, and those were both short-term and long-term effects. But again, all of those differences were seen when yoga was compared to no active treatment. When it was compared to other exercise regimens, there weren't any significant differences. So the bottom line is that exercise is good for your back pain, which is not a surprise.
And the list of things that yoga has been shown to improve goes on and on. There are studies showing that an hour of yoga a day can improve your typing speed. Yoga reduces pain from carpal tunnel syndrome. There's a review showing statistically significant reductions in seizures in people with epilepsy. One review shows improvements in menstrual cramps and another review shows improvements in migraines. You wouldn't think of yoga for cancer, but yoga improves nausea and vomiting after chemotherapy. In the Cochrane review, it improved quality of life in cancer patients and it reduced their fatigue and helped them to sleep. But again, this is when you compare it to no intervention. When compared to other forms of exercise, it was about the same. But what about the flip side? Is yoga safe? So there are reports out there of musculoskeletal injuries, nervous system injuries, and even eye injuries related to yoga. So yes, if you wanna launch into extreme poses like a headstand or the lotus position on day one, you're kind of asking for it. But the bottom line is that just like the benefits, the potential harms of yoga are likely no worse than any other form of exercise. As for long-term wear and tear on the joints or on the spine, some studies have shown some harm, but others have shown benefits, so we don't really know. So you will hear a lot of claims about the various mental and physical health benefits of yoga. And as it turns out, most of these claims are supported by some level of evidence. Now the trials are small, and we need more evidence, but the signals are encouraging, and frankly, the breadth of conditions that yoga seems to improve is impressive. On the other hand, whether yoga is actually better than other forms of exercise for most of these outcomes is unclear. It's a great choice if you're going to do exercise, but it's not clearly better than other choices that you may have. The one thing that might be special about yoga is that it seems to be able to provide these health benefits largely without the same physical demands of a vigorous exercise regimen. So we still have lots to learn, but I'm ready to dust off my yoga mat. For more on health and science, subscribe to the feed.